afternoon and welcome uh, to the first lecture in the full speaker series hosted by the Institute of International Development Studies. Um, and this talk today is also co-sponsored by the McGill Refugee Research Group. I'm Diana Allen from the Department of Anthropology in ESSID, and I'm going to be chairing um, the discussion. So we'll begin with a talk, and then we'll have probably be around 45 minutes, I think, hopefully for, um, for discussion afterwards. I want to begin um, by acknowledging that McGill University is located on unceded indigenous lands. The Haudenosaunee and An Anishinaabe nations are recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather virtually today. Chukchogi or Montreal is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today it is the home, to, the home of a diverse population of indigenous and settler peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present and future in our ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples within Chukchogi and Montreal community. Um, I'm really delighted to introduce our speaker today, Elizabeth Ellis, who's an assistant professor in the Department of History at New York University. Prior to joining NYU, she was the Barra Postdoctoral Fellow and a visiting assistant professor at the McNeil Center for Early American Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Ellis's current book project examines the history of the small, smaller native nations of the Lower Mississippi Valley, and her research is focused on the formation of native nations in the early Southeast and examines the ways that indigenous peoples shaped and limited the extent of European colonization. She's a citizen of the Priora tribe of Oklahoma and also writes about contemporary indigenous issues and political movements, which is what we'll be engaging her um, on today. And as I mentioned um, earlier, we read uh, one of um, Professor Ellis's recent articles in a class um, that I've been teaching on displacement. Um, which, like her talk today, will engage with these critical debates, um, engaged with these critical debates over sovereignty in North America and explored uh, the intersecting struggles of Native Americans and migrants. And in this article, she invited us to kind of think about how um, the recognition of indigenous sovereignty might allow for a critical reframing of these conversations about borders and restrictive immigration policies. Um, and she reminded us in this piece that recognizing the sovereignty of native peoples and questioning who has the right um, to determine who belongs and who doesn't um, in, in kind of questioning this, we're not only supporting the rights of the land's original inhabitants, but also challenging the violent reach of settler colonial states uh, and their power to make exclusionary policies. And obviously the um, images that we've been seeing today uh, and this week of violent, uh, the violent deportation of Haitians encamped in Del Rio, Texas, uh, a reminder of how vitally important these conversations are. Um, Professor Ellis's talk today is entitled The Borders Crossed Us to Migrant Justice and Border Crossing in Indigenous North American Communities. We're really, really thrilled to have you with us today. Thank you so much for um, giving us your time and uh, sharing your work with us. We're really excited to have the opportunity to engage it. Um, so please, everyone, join me in um, welcoming uh, Professor Ellis uh, uh, virtually. Sorry, to, I wish we were here to wish you were with us so we could um, be in a kind of more embodied state. But hopefully in the future, you can come back um, and, and, and we can have you in person. But thank you so much, and um, let me turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much for that very generous introduction and for setting up and framing some of the conversation today. I'd like to um, uh, thank in particular Dr. Allen, Dr. Bradley, and Dr. Le Poulin de Waru. I'm sorry, I'm sure I just butchered that. But anyway, I'm very grateful to all of you for hosting me and for this, this conversation today. I'm sorry I'm not able to join you all in person. Um, I'm calling in from Lenape homelands in Manahata, in Manhattan, in New York City. So this land where I live and teach now uh, is actually home to one of the largest urban indigenous populations in the United States. Um, and it remains a center of Lenape homelands who are the original people and caretakers of this land. 
So while Lenape people have been dispossessed and have some of whom have managed to remain in and around New York, New Jersey and Delaware, Lenape communities have also been spread through this process of colonization as far as Oklahoma, Wisconsin and Southwestern Ontario. Um, so I'm excited to join you. I get to speak about immigration, borders, and indigenous history. I'm going to try and leave a good chunk of time at the end so we can kind of have a conversation and I have the chance to learn from some of what it sounds like you all have been discussing this week. Um, let me go ahead and see if I can successfully share my screen and then we will go from there. Perfect. Okay. So I want to be clear before I start that I'm approaching this conversation as someone living in the United States um, and a lot of my critique and focus is geared has been geared towards US policies and the kind of contemporary nation state ideologies that bind indigenous people who live within this land um, and structure our daily lives. But I think a lot of these issues cross both north and south of the United States borders and so overlap with many of the same kinds of conversations we're having right now in Mexico um, and among First Nations communities. I'm an early Americanist by training, and I come to this contemporary conversation both through my own research on how Native American immigration and practices of offering sanctuary and refuge to Native and non-Native migrants and immigrants in the historic past shaped early Native nation building in the area that is now the Gulf Coast of the United States. Um, I should similarly position myself as someone who's dedicated to migrant justice and as a Native person who's been disheartened and somewhat frustrated by a lot of the framing of conversations recently, um, some of which frame Indigenous rights as oppositional to Indigenous sovereignty and territorial claims. And I want to talk about how I think that these are not really oppositional struggles and forces, but are both alternatives to the exclusionary logics of nation states that catch so many of us um, within their binds today. So I'm going to start recent and then track back in time, come back recent, go back in time again. So this talk is gonna move sort of temporally back and forth between our contemporary moment um, and the 17th and 18th century, which are the times that I know best. Um, so as uh, Dr. Allen mentioned just a minute ago when we were starting, I think in recent days, uh, international news has been dominated by images of refugees and migrants and crises near the Del Rio, near Del Rio, Texas, and along the US and Mexico border. And many of these most recent um, migrants are immigrants are Haitian, but this place of the US border has long been a place of passage for immigrants from all across the Caribbean, as well as from across North America and into South America. We've seen heart-wrenching images of families and young children um, in makeshift camps, grieving, trying to process the violence they're experiencing, and encountering militarized border patrol. And these have become all too familiar. So while the United States current president, Joseph Biden, is widely perceived to have a somewhat more humane approach to immigration policy, at least as compared to the previous president, Donald Trump, who became infamous, right, for holding children in cages and separating families and, you know, enacting these really barbaric policies. Um, I think that many of the broader processes and approaches to immigration remain the same throughout the two administrations. So our current administration may not be leading a drive to build the wall um, and cast out dreamers, but there's very much the same kind of uh, approach to who is welcome and who is not. I'm thinking here of Kamala Harris's statement in June confronting a wash of Guatemalan migrants who are seeking to enter the US um, and herself the daughter of immigrants standing here and saying, don't come. That is my message to Guatemalan asylum seekers, people who are looking to migrate to the United States, don't come. So I think what Harris's statement misses and what in addition, well, in addition to ethical accountability, right, to take care of refugees in crisis, is that many of the people who are coming from Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, Nicaragua, and elsewhere through the southern border are indigenous peoples and peoples whose ancestors traded, traveled, and migrated across North America for centuries before the creation of this relatively recent 1848 southern border. And so in addition to failing to see migrants as indigenous people with rights to move across the borders of settler nations, this view insists that the United States is the only entity in this, in this, this discussion just at the southern border with the authority to make these decisions about who can come and who can belong 
even as it, on the other hand, and in some circumstances, recognizes the land that it is policing and asking people to come or not to come to remains the sovereign territory of many indigenous nations today. So by framing the discussion over immigration onto Native American and First Nations homelands without including contemporary Native nations in the policy and decision-making process, these settler states, and this is true of Canada as well, continue to infringe upon not just the sovereignty of peoples whose lands stretch across borders, but this also undermines indigenous sovereignty in its, in its daily praxis, right? So I think one of the, the kind of classical framings here is to say the border has crossed us too, right? The border has come through our communities. And this is something that is a shared experience of indigenous peoples across the, the Americas. And so it's something that represents the imposition of these colonial domains. So what I want to argue today is that settler legal systems um, in the US and in Canada as well have worked hard for centuries to prevent Native people from being able to determine who can cross onto and who can belong in their homelands. And this may be really evident for anyone who's familiar with First Nations or Native American history. But what I think is really important in terms of thinking about our contemporary moment and framing the debates around policy and promise, you know, and the kind of like who gets the right to this territory conversations are first of all that native contests um, and pushback against borders and restrictions and immigration are extensions of very long fights for control of territory and claims to belong and decide to get what decide to be able to participate in what the future looks like for our nations. The second part of this is that immigration and the incorporation of migrants and outsiders was actually a super important part of historic native nation building. And so freezing native people in time, saying that process of bringing in outsiders, of dealing with refugees, of providing asylum, right, of expanding our notions of kinship and citizenship um, also freezes native people out of modernity in the way that we usually think about the roles of contemporary nations. So if we cannot imagine Native nations as being capable of growing and expanding, of providing asylum, we're both undermining Native sovereignty and limiting our visions of both Indigenous and migrant futures on this land. So I want to walk through a couple of different examples of how First Nations and Native American peoples have contested borders, immigration, citizenship policies in the US, um, and a little bit in Canada. And we'll track sort of again back and forth in time to do some of this. Um, so I think the border between the US and Mexico looms really large in our uh, ideology of what the fight, at least in the United States, of what the fight over immigration looks like. Um, for many people, right, this border represents hope and promise of new opportunities. It also signifies danger and violence and separation from families. Um, and thousands each year are detained at the US border, as well as hundreds of migrants who regularly die attempting to cross this hyper militarized zone. And both um, folks in Mexico, folks in the US, indigenous communities across this territory have really criticized the United States practices and argued for structural overhauls of detention, deportation, and asylum policies. Um, I think many of the, the sort of rationales for supporting reforms to the current U US immigration policy system typically appeal to humanitarian sympathy and visions of a modern world that provide all humans with rights to migrate and to citizenship. But we often omit native people from this conversation, again, thinking that they have no part in the modern discussions over immigration onto their homelands, which frames native people as working in this kind of retentionist mode, right? We're only trying to preserve what we already have. So in this context, then including native people bolsters challenges to US borders and opens up possibilities for alternative models of relationality and nationhood that might help us reimagine solutions to our current humanitarian crisis. So long before the birth of the US or, the, or Mexico or the expansion of the United States um, west of the Mississippi River, the region that's currently Texas and New Mexico was tended and, and stretching down into Mexico, was tended and controlled by native people who understood themselves as intimately linked to the land itself and to larger networks. So I have here just a map of a single commodity trade. This is like circa 1500. Um, 
but this would expand, extend further back in time. And this is the movement of turquoise um, before European settlement in the region. I could have mapped, um, you know, macaw feathers and sort of focused on further connections between Mexico into Nicaragua and Costa Rica. But the point here is really that there are these vibrant exchanges that native people and native societies depend on that stretch all through this corridor that's now broken up by borders between Mexico and Guatemala, by borders between Mexico and the United States, and that picture these as segmented and separated kinds of economies, peoples, and communities. And it's not so much that native people didn't have specific ideas of control of territory as that there were processes in place to regulate who was able to move and how folks were able to move between different pieces of territory. So in the 17th century, the Southwestern United States was dominated by Apaches, Caddo's, Comanches, and many other smaller native polities. And these people, while frequently in the US anyway, imagery, we think of them as Westerns, as raiding people, as people moving in sort of chaotic frameworks, this really isn't true at all. So I have an image here from an article that Juliana Barr wrote um, about indigenous territoriality in what is currently Texas. Um, and this is right around the, the turn of the um, 18th century. And what is mapped on here, you can see in the little dashed lines and the hard lines, are Karankawa, um, Hassanai, and other conceptions of indigenous territory. And the point here is not so much that native people have hard borders that are firmly exclusionary to other people, but that native people had really concrete ideas about which kind of territory belonged to them. And they had processes for bringing people in and letting them move through territory. So one could not cross through Karankawa territory without first forming relationships with those people so that folks could pass um, peacefully. She writes that Spanish settlers who encountered Karankawa and Hassanai peoples in, in Texas reported that the groups had such strict understandings of their territories that they would not cross into other groups' lands in order to meet with Spanish newcomers. Spanish officials found they were only permitted onto these lands after building relationships with the native people who lived there. So basically, in order to access indigenous territory, there wasn't some kind of you know, exclusionary policy that said, if you are not born here, if you are not from here, you cannot move here, but rather that access to territory was dependent upon relationships of accountability with the peoples who controlled these lands. So while I'm emphasizing indigenous territoriality, this is different than modern formulations of nation states that inherently exclude, right, based on quotas, based on land of birth, people's access to territory. So by forming relationships with groups who had already had connections to specific rivers, grasslands, pine nuts, trees, non-human relations, so not just the land, but also what we might think of as natural resources, right? Accountability to bodies of water, accountabilities to other kinds of resources. Indigenous groups and Spanish settlers could be made into relations and brought into the social and political networks that would help connect their people to these lands. In effect, outsiders can be brought into spaces and given access to resources by forging relationships. And I think this is really key to understanding indigenous um, thought about migration and movement and uh, access to territory in this, this, um, this time period. There are other ways that native people use incorporation of outsiders to both bolster their territoriality and to expand um, their political power. And I'll come back in a couple of minutes to like why I think this is so important for the contemporary context, but I'm gonna focus for just a second on like what native people's conceptions of territory and borders and movement in this region looked like before European imp imposition of um, you know, these dividing lines. So here we're looking at Comanche territory or Comancheria. Um, this map has removed all other native people and slapped on a bunch of state names, but we should imagine it as also full of all kinds of other people's territory, some of which overlaps. But I think for what I'm about to talk about, this is relatively clear. And some of this is drawn from Pekka Hamelainen's um, Comanche Empire, which is, is some of where this information is coming from. So in the late 18th and early 19th century, just as the United States was growing and expanding its empire in the East, Comanches too built an expansionist polity on the Great Plains. Um, this was not a political force that was built on the exclusion or the extermination or resource, resource extraction of people and um, non-human relations within this territory. 
Rather than what we currently call New Mexico and Western Texas, Comanches famously built a massive grasslands empire. And they did this in part by incorporating refugees and newcomer groups who sought to join their people. Moreover, by forging relationships with outside groups, with groups like Shoshones, Utes, um, and other folks, they pulled an extended network of non-Comanche people into their web of relationships. So using strategic raids and the power of these political connections, as well as their growing sort of social base, um, Comanches halted the spread of Spanish dominion northward and maintained control of large swaths of territory in what is currently Texas. This is really important because in the 19th century after the Louisiana Purchase, the Mexican government was so desperate to finally gain control of this territory that it in part invited US settlers to help move into Northern Mexico on the theory that if there was enough settler population, it could check Comanche power, right? This in turn, along with US pushes to send settlers into this contested region, um, facilitates the development of the Republic of Texas and the annexation of this territory to the U.S., which in turn sparks the um, conflict between the U.S. and Mexico in 1846 and leads to the redrawing of the border between the United States and Mexico in 1848. In effect then, right, Comanche and native power is part of what shapes the creation of the modern border and allows for the expansion of US power in later time periods into this region. So expanding Comanche power and the increased military capacity of Inde or Apache and other Southwestern native peoples in lands that are now New Mexico continue to create tension even after the conclusion of this war in 1848. So the Mexican government demanded financial compensation when, from the US when the US failed to keep good on their promises to halt Indian raids, meaning the native people's attempts to defend their homelands that settlers were invading on. Um, this was part of the agreement that ended the conflict between the US and Mexico. And when the, federal, the United States federal government could not provide good on this, uh, this promise, the Mexican government demanded financial reparations because of the ongoing violence in this region. So this leads to increased tension between the US and Mexico. It kind of looks like the two nations are gonna come to blows again in the early 1850s. Um, and ultimately this dispute is settled by the US agreeing to pay an additional 15 million for 45,000 square miles. Um, and this is the Gadsden Purchase of 1853, which is highlighted on this slide in a slightly darker color. I'm gonna tell you in a second about why this is this Gadsden purchase is important. So native nations, of course, do not decide that because there's now a border here, this is the end of the contest over territory and that there is no more point um, to contesting US uh, control. For a very long time, the policing and the enforcement of this border is loose. People are moving border posts, right? People on the ground are refusing to recognize these lines that divide their communities. Um, and so folks are living in a way that fails to acknowledge the, this theoretical imposition of a border through their lives. For many native nations, this looks like protecting their territories and their homelands and both insisting on their right to move as well as using military force to try and keep settlers out. This results in the, um, the second half of the 19th century with really brutal US policies to remove and corral um, Apache and Diné, uh, Navajo, and all kinds of other Southeast, Southwestern nations in these really brutal military campaigns. I wanna look at Tana, Tana Autumn, which is one of the nations whose territories gets chopped up by the creation of this border um, and on land that was part of the, the Gadsden Purchase. So the Tana Autumn, whose lands and communities straddle the US-Mexico border between um, Arizona and Sonora, have vehemently opposed the extension of the border wall through their territories. This was a fundamental part of Trump's plan for the region, right, is build the wall, build the wall through this region. It's really tough desert. It's not exactly like a, a place that's an easy place to make a border crossing. It's, it's hard country, but it's also somewhere where Tahana Autumn people have made their homes and their communities for generations and generations. So the border wall constitutes a direct assault on the Tana Autumn sovereignty onto their territories. In 2017, as the Trump administration ratcheted up its efforts, Berlan Jose, the former vice chairman of Tana Autumn, powerfully rejected the federal government's claims to exert their borders over his people's land. As he put it, 
only over my dead body will a wall be built. And Jose and others have been able to keep their word and have put truly their bodies on the line to defend the Tana Autumn Reservation and homelands. Um, young youth groups like the um, Tana Autumn Anti-Border Collective have taken direct action in recent times. They've chained themselves to machinery. They've attempted to physically disrupt this process. And while Tana Autumn people have been successful in preventing the imposition of the border onto their much smaller reservation lands, the land here that's in orange is sort of the historic um, boundaries of Tana Autumn land. And much of that has been carved up by the border wall in recent years. So bulldozers and explosives have torn through Tana Autumn ancestral homelands and carved this larger territory more firmly with, with um, border walls between 2019 and 2020. So when asked to respond to the incursions into his people's homelands in the recent two years, Jose, who's no longer um, chairman, but is still very invo involved in this fight against the border, says, it feels like someone got a knife and dragged it across my heart. So Jose's statement has been picked up by national media and celebrated by immigrants and US citizens alike. Right, the critique of federal policy using indigenous sovereignty, again, demonstrates the power of these narratives in challenging the normalization of imperial borders and exclusionary settler colonial policies. I should also note that a lot of the folks who are defending Tana Autumn homelands are doing so not just for people and people's rights to cross, but in protection of the health of those lands, of migrant birds, of animals, of plants, of people who they see themselves as tied to through these webs of reciprocal relationships kind of like what I talked about just a minute ago in terms of how do they manage and how do they claim this land. This is all about relationships of accountability to this place. Um, I also should point out that Tana Autumn people are not unanimous in supporting migration and the prevention um, of walls through their, well, they pretty much all object to the wall, but they don't all object to federal attempts to stop immigration through their homelands. There are divisions and some of the community are opposed to things like setting up water stations that would allow migrants to cross less dangerously if they need to move through this territory. But I think the the kind of the point I'm trying to make here is that beyond thinking about you know who holds documents, who receives citizenships, and how to enforce borders, we need to think about the fundamental accountability of these territories and about the borders of this colonial state and the assumption that the federal government should be able to make these policies and these plans instead of the Ta'ana Autumn nation, right? Basically, this is a fight for the nation to have itself over whether or not they want to support migrants, they want to police their boundaries, they want to enforce these kinds of things. This is not something that the federal government should exclusively be deciding. So throughout the 19th century, as American settlers streamed ever westward across North America, the young United States was confronted with the question of what to do about indigenous nations who fell within its expanding territories. Um, there had been long centuries of violence and conflict between settlers who would become part of the United States and native people in the centuries that preceded the American Revolution. But the territorial land base of the American Republic really rapidly expands in the 19th century. And this nation could no longer simply push native nations beyond the boundaries of its border. So instead in the 19th century, the US develops complementary policies of social exclusion, territorial expulsion and political incorporation. And these collectively serve to dispossess native communities of their lands and to dismantle territorial sovereignty. Um, so this process is really long and complex. And you know we can talk more about some of the specifics in this in the Q&A. But basically, the drive here is to figure out how to access native land and to undermine native people's rights to, pol to police their territory, meaning that basically, if you were non-native and you crossed into native land, you should theoretically be under native jurisdiction. But the federal government goes to a lot of effort to figure out ways to undermine that, to limit the territorial sovereignty of native nations. Um, as a way to undermine um, indigenous control of land. So using a logic of barbarism, uh, well, basically on the most basic level, we can think about the logic of indigenous dispossession in the 19th century as a product of this extractive colonization plan coupled with an emerging racial ideology that envisioned no future for native people within the modern United States. <clears throat> 
so much as African Americans were enslaved and barred from citizenship on the basis of their race and their supposed biological inferiority. Through most of the 19th century, Native people are also barred from citizenship based on their supposed inherent savagery and primitivism and the belief that their savage nature is transmitted through their blood. And some of this is the origins before it becomes codified in US policy, both through the Dawes Act, which is um, in 1887 and designed to carve up land. And then what the US calls the Indian Reorganization Act basically are the two things that's 1934. That's the time period when blood quantum becomes part of US federal policy. But the ideas about race and inherent primitivism are structuring this time period before this becomes really solidified in US policy. And I think this is really important because in addition to creating a racial ideology, it freezes native people as these things that exist in the past tense, right? It makes them incommensurate with modernity. And this is something that writers like Phil Deloria talk a lot about, but this is key to also preventing native nations from being modern nations is not just the individual people, but the kind of political structures as a whole. So um, using this logic of barbarism and racial inferiority, the United States pursued the massive dispossession project of native people within its borders over the course of the century. Um, while the process of individual settlers violently pushing into native territories continues as it had for centuries prior, in the early 1800s, the US formalizes the process of forced removal for native nations in the Southeast, like Cherokees, Chickasaws, Choctaws, and Seminoles to land in Oklahoma. Meantime, it launches these massive military campaigns against nations in the West using the fresh power of the post-Civil War US military to launch campaigns against Lakota people, against Cheyenne people, um, against Diné people. We can kind of think of um, these, these conflicts in the West as an expansion of the Civil War and this drive to unify and expand um, the United States continental power. So if the 19th century is marked by US efforts to exterminate native peoples and to repel them from their homelands, the 20th century was framed by perhaps less explicitly violent, but no less insidious processes of eradication of indigenous identity and the political dismantling of native nations, um, basically destroying the separate sovereign status of nations that pre-exist the US. I think we often think about the extension of US citizenship as a positive good and as the ultimate goal for people who wish to live permanently in what is currently the United States. This is often how we teach US history courses is like battles for equal American citizenship and battles for equal rights. And this is where I think um, indigenous stories really complicate some of this narrative. So while for some native people, they see the expansion of US citizenship in 1924 as having promise, right? It lets people out of these really insidious ward and guardianship systems that prevented them from controlling their own funds, um, from managing their own homes. It gave them opportunities to um, work, you know, beyond the reservation. Um, for lots of people, this was an imposition of colonial power and a rejection or reneging of their inherent sovereignty and their right as uh, autonomous or as people who are, belong to autonomous nations. So this is especially true for native people who've long lived on their own sovereign lands, right? Who didn't go through process of removal and don't have land through their relationship with the federal government. So, while the US fervently denied citizenship to Chinese immigrants and to many Latino families, it forced citizenship onto native people in mass. These policies can actually be understood as part of the same project to build an exclusionary empire. So forcing citizenship on one group of people and excluding another people, another group of people or groups from having access to this same privilege of citizenship. In response to this move, some Native peoples completely rejected U.S. citizenship, insisting that they could not simply be forced to become U.S. citizens without their consent. As Akwesasne Mohawk, right, this is Haudenosaunee, um, Charles Benedict argued in 1941 when he explained the rejection of U.S. citizenship by some Mohawk nationals. The assumption that the U.S. could incorporate Native people simply by passing laws or claiming to have jurisdiction over territory was absurd. Citizenship, Benedict argued, cannot possibly apply to Indians since they are independent nations. Congress may as well pass a law making Mexican citizens. So in effect, if the U.S. could turn foreign nations and their people into domestic territories and U.S. citizens, 
the United States right could then claim the resources held by their those people and their right to implement legal restrictions on their behalf to control their territories right to place borders through their lands. And this leads to a complete reimagining of Native people's relationships to their lands, to Native people's relationships to outsiders, and this way in which we, th this policy is concurrent with U.S. efforts to restrict who gets to belong within Native nations. So by continuing to travel on their own passports and assert their sovereignty and rights to cross borders over the whole of the 20th century, and I'll focus on Haudenosaunee here, but this is true for um, Native peoples uh, like across the, um, the, the United States. Um, Haudenosaunee people engage in what Mohawk scholar Audra Simpson has termed the politics of refusal. So Ganawage Mohawks refuse to change the way they identify, refuse to use other citizenship or identities. They refuse to change the way they relate to their lands or to their relatives across the border. They refuse to recognize the imposition of colonial law. Some folks travel internationally on Iroquois passports. Um, and this fundamentally challenges and unsettles both the US and Canada's rights to these lands, as well as to impose a border. And it forces us to reckon with the ongoing sovereignty and territoriality of Mohawk and Haudenosaunee people. So I wanna ask like, what is the potential if we recognize modern Native Americans and take Native sovereignty seriously? What if we expand this critique to say not just that not, to say not just that Native nations can reject national borders and decide who they can exclude, but what if they can make their own policies about who they want to include or welcome as they have for generations in the past? Can Native nations only provide critiques of our current system or could they actually provide tangible sanctuary? Each Native nation in the United States determines its own citizenship and enrollment policies. And given the long history of incorporating outsiders into Native nations, what I wanna ask is could Native nations offer citizenship or asylum to refugees and migrants fleeing violence in their homelands? And I think about this because it's such a prevalent part of what I understand to be the processes of nation building and political power in the 17th and 18th century Southeast. Quite simply, this region does not make sense without attention to the vitality of immigration in Native people's efforts to survive colonialism and to build strong communities. So this is a little bit east of where we were looking um, earlier in the talk at Comancheria. So this is what is currently um, Mississippi and Louisiana. That's the Mississippi River running there from the top to the bottom. This is a map of the lower Mississippi Valley in the early 18th century. What you can see here are clusters of smaller autonomous political groups. Um, most of the people on this map, so folks like the Tensas, Natchez, Homas, Pascagoulas, uh, Chitimachas, these are groups of 300 to 3,000 people. And they're living in what is probably best described as a borderland, not in the sense of there being no law, but in the sense that they're being contested and overlapping sovereignty. So there's not like a Comancheria here where it's one kind of really powerful group and everybody else falls within that. Each of these nations has their own sort of carved out spaces of sovereignty that are dependent upon their relations to each other. So you get this kind of layering effect of overlapping sovereignties. Okay, so if you can like look at this map and see that section along where the Yazoo River hits the Mississippi River, um, there's a cluster of native nations all living right alongside each other. So Koroas, Grigras, Tiu, Ofagulas, Tunicas, Yazoos, that's the kind of conglomerate of six nations packed really close together into this territory. And this is because of the, the practice of offering resettlement and refuge to immigrants and migrants in crisis. So during the late 17th and early 18th century, the, the big political processes in this region are largely defined by the migration of native peoples from the East who are encountering the brunt of colonialism along the Eastern seaboard and along um, the Gulf Coast. So, British incursions into what's currently New England um, and the Mid-Atlantic and Spanish incursions into what's currently Florida. 
So Native nations regularly take in outside groups and offer them resettlement alongside their own nations. This could be small groups of individual people, which is how I think we most often talk about the incorporation of outsiders into Native nations, like as adoptives, right, as captives, these individual things. But these groups also took in entire nations and communities to host for shorter or longer periods of time, say maybe several months or a few years, in some cases decades. And in some cases, this leads to permanent incorporation. In many cases, it doesn't. What it provides is a temporary sanctuary for people to live before they choose to move on and pursue their next kind of destination. So the group here that's labeled as Ophagulas in that um, cluster I just showed you, I'm just gonna use this as a specific example, but this would apply to a lot of the nations here. So the folks there who are Ophagulas are Siouan speaking migrants who are originally from the Ohio River Valley. And they get caught in a conflict between Haudenosaunee and British and French people in the mid 17th century. And so try and get out of the region to avoid the violence. They trek over land all the way to the Mississippi and they come down to this multinational settlement where there are already Tunicas, Tiu, Koroas, and Yazoos living, and they ask for refuge and resettlement. These nations all understand the vital need for groups who have been disrupted by colonial violence to be able to safely find places to land and to recover with their communities. So they offer them land alongside their villages. What this looks like in practice is that Ofagula political leaders can exercise authority over their own nation and they can choose to leave as they please. They're not bounded to this place. Um, really, they only need to respect the overarching guidance of their host nation. And this most often applies to things like land use, hunting rights, grounds, right, and their treatment of the other peoples in the settlement. And I can talk about how the French get pulled into this system and really mess things up because they don't understand this accountability thing in the Q&A. But basically, the system is very, very flexible and it allows for autonomy of migrant communities. So the reason that Native nations do this is they understand that they are more powerful when they are in relation with these outside groups of people and that by forging relationships to not only newcomers who they're directly integrating in their nation, but to these other powers, they're strengthening their networks. And for small groups like this, this also provides kind of a defensive you know, settlement, a multinational settlement where there are more people in the case that raiders come, in the case that colonists try and you know, smash into their homelands. So the multinational settlement or international settlement I've been talking about with these six nations, um, at the turn of the 17th century, it's around 4,000 people. And so while this group, the Ofagulas, will actually go on to relocate several times over the course of the century, both to take advantage of economic opportunities, so you could think of them as economic migrants, and to flee violence in their homelands, so they'll move down um, and live uh, kind of where the Homas are living now, where the Tunicas have also lived, they'll move and live next to French people at what's labeled as Natchez on this map. And then they'll move again in the late 18th century to another multinational settlement of indigenous people. In all cases, they're moving to take refuge or to seek resettlement alongside foreign nations. And this is a really important part of their political strategy. So, the descendants of the Ophagulas um, today are the Tunica Biloxi tribe of Louisiana. So these longstanding partnerships that Ophagula people begin to forge with Tunicas in the 17th century endure for generations and generations. This nation, Tunica Biloxi, which is in Louisiana today, is actually the descendants of Choctaws, some of whom left the larger Choctaw communities and migrated out to live in smaller communities of Voiles, Biloxis, and Tunicas. In fact, even the name of their nation, Tunica Biloxi, references the multinational past of this community. And the practice of bringing together people and living alongside foreigners ultimately leads to the consolidation in the early 20th century of these multiple native nations who are living in close proximity. And larger nations do this too. This is not just a practice that's confined to very small native people. Some of these smaller groups go into Choctaw Nation territory during the 18th century to escape colonial violence. Individual towns of Chickasaws seek refuge with Creek peoples um, and Choctaws like the people who will become the, um, part of the Tunica Biloxi, small groups move out of their nations and live alongside foreigners. <clears throat> 
Um, in fact, Chickasaws integrated so many outsiders during the 18th century that by the 1770s, Northwest, who is a Chickasaw leader, described the nation as primarily composed of non-ethnic Chickasaws. The point I'm making here is that racial and ethnic boundaries did not separate how Native people thought about who could become part of their community or their ethics of what they felt like they needed to do in terms of caretaking for migrants, refugees, and people seeking economic potential. Um, this is true as well. I, you know, I talked about Haudenosaunee briefly earlier, but if we think about even the fact that during the 1720s, Tuscarora people who are fleeing colonial violence in North Carolina migrate up and join the Haudenosaunee community as a sixth nation, right? They took in, in, in a whole nation in addition to all kinds of individuals um, and captives and outsiders to make themselves a really strong power um, that both the United, well, the British and then the United States, French and then Canadian governments had to contend with. And again, these integrations are not necessarily limited to indigenous people. In the case of my own nation, Peoria, we took in numbers of Frenchmen in addition to we, Miami, um, Pianca Shaw, Kaskaskias, all kinds of different nations that come together to make the modern uh, communities that we have today. Um, again, this includes Europeans, Africans, and African-Americans who are integrated as full members of native nations across the country. During the 1870s, for example, Plains Ojibwe in what is now North Dakota took in hundreds of Métis people, uh, people of mixed right French and indigenous ancestry who were forced to flee after the collapse of Louis Riel's rebellion. The descendants of these Plains Ojibwe and Métis people are now the Turtle Mountain Chippewa. Um, basically, this is really, really common for most of the early time period. There's a really concerted effort on the part of the US to stop and limit immigration as part of these policies of creating removal and blood quantum in the 19th century. So I just want to tell you quickly about a Supreme Court case and then I'll kind of wrap up this talk. In the mid 19th century, the Supreme Court was explicitly, this is the US Supreme Court, challenging the rights of native nations to continue to integrate non-ethnically indigenous people, whatever that means, because like I just told you, native people are taking all kinds of folks in the time period before that. So in 1846, the Supreme Court heard the case of William Rogers, an Anglo-Cherokee man who'd been adopted into the Cherokee nation and was accused of murdering another Anglo-Cherokee man, Jacob Nicholson who had also been adopted into the Cherokee Nation. Functionally, these men are both Cherokees, although we might think today that they look phenotypically white. They're both living within Cherokee territory in what is currently Oklahoma. At that point, it would have been Indian territory. And the Supreme Court ruled that although the men had become Cherokees, they remained white. So racially, what the US thought of as non-Indian. And thus, Rogers could be tried in a US circuit court for his crimes. In effect, the Supreme Court ruled that race trumped geographical jurisdiction when it came to enforcing US laws over native nations and territories. And it rejected indigenous ideologies that recognized these men as Cherokees. Um, legal challenges to native jurisdiction over territory and the limitation of native people's ability to govern themselves um, and their lands only increased in the 19th and 20th century. And both the US and Canada developed increasingly restrictive definitions of indigeneity in ways that force the contraction of native nations, right? The ability to say who belongs um, rather than growth and an expansion as would be natural for the course of the nation. Um, so the point I'm trying to make here is that is not so much that like all native nations tomorrow should wake up and start naturalizing outsiders. I don't think that would be politically palatable in many cases, nor would it be viable necessarily as we know so many indigenous nations, especially now in the midst of COVID are struggling just to get access to enough resources to take care of the people that they currently have. The point that I um, wanna make is that Native people and indigenous sovereignty, I think, can offer more critiques of the colonial system than just borders. While borders are vitally important, they're only one part of this question around the right to move, to migrate, and to belong. Second, I want to emphasize that historically immigration to Native communities and among Native communities was vital and that the disruption and extinguishment of this capability represents not only a challenge to Native sovereignty, but also the dismantling of a key tool that many native nations relied on to survive earlier colonial impositions. 
Finally, that migration or immigration and indigeneity are not oppositional in nature, but rather that seeing Native people as modern and in motion, I'm thinking here of Gerald Visner's Transmotion, right, the right of Native peoples to evolve, to change, to move across time and space, um, are vital parts of our contemporary lives, as is the motion and migration of peoples um, around the globe and across the Americas. So I will leave it at that and hopefully we'll have time for some conversation and I look forward to um, chatting with you. Thank you, Michine. Thank you so much. That was really wonderful. Um, yes, I should do this too, I've forgotten. <laughs> yes, here we are. Um, so let's let's open up to, for discussion. We have um, just over half an hour, about 40 minutes. Um, so uh, you can, and just to remind you, you can either post a, dis a question in the chat or raise your hand um, and pose a question that way. Megan. Hi. Um, thank you so much, Liz, for this talk. Uh, you know, it was just absolutely fabulous. One of the most, I think, thought provoking talks that I've heard in a long time. So thank you so much thank you. Uh, for sharing this with us. Um, as I imagine you might know, in Canada at the moment, we're in the midst of an ongoing discussion around the idea of reconciliation and uh, reparation uh, in relation to the residential school system in particular, but also settler colonialism more generally. I mean, I think sometimes the discussion is, is too constrained to the specific question of residential schools. Um, but for me, thinking about your talk, uh, you know, against the, the backdrop of this ongoing conversation that we had here just prompted me to want to ask you what significance you think ideas about reconciliation and reparation might have in relation to the ideas that you've shared with us today? I mean, is there a sense in which we might think of, um, you know, recognition of sovereign control over membership and trying to take these ideas more seriously? Does that have a kind of reparative function or is that, uh, you know, not really the frame that might be useful here? Yeah, no, I'm, I mean, I'm super glad you bring that up, right? I think the conversation around, you know, how would you even begin to do the damage done by things like the Indian Act, right? And the policing of who gets to be part of Indigenous nations in Canada are definitely um, really large and really wide ranging. I think the way that I think about this, right, is that I guess I'm very influenced by both um, Kim Talver and Audra Simpson and their sort of approaches, as well as some of the theory that's coming out of what so it and and folks contests over um, pipelines that Canada is pushing through Indigenous territories, even as they're saying we need to begin this healing process. And I think the question for me ultimately comes back to power, right? And like reconciliation, there is there is certainly healing. And I know a lot of folks who've survived um, boarding schools and gone on to talk about it, right, have found meaning in Canada acknowledging a lot of the harm that these histories and these experiences have done. We have not had a similar kind of reckoning in a real way in the United States. My grandparents went to, to boarding schools and a lot of folks of um, their generation in our community, you know, were sort of pushed through that, that process and we have not had something similar. And so I don't want to discount um, the folks who have said that it really does is meaningful for them to have public spaces to talk about the harm that's been done by Canadian policies. But I think that as long as the power imbalance remains so dramatic, it's really hard to think about reconciliation as a process for healing and reparation, while the ability of Native nations to determine these things is still so limited. And so I think that for things like, you know, we can think about, um, boarding schools and stolen generations in Canada, and then think about the way that indi so many indigenous youth end up in these institutionalized systems, right, in their teens and how that makes them vulnerable. And so I would think that, you know, as opposed to sort of very focused on the, the past and the, I think the past tenseness of a lot of the language around reconciliation of, you know, we're very sorry that that's happened in the past, drawing really firm lines between something like, 
the boarding school process and the way that Indigenous children are taken out of their homes, placed in Canadian care systems that fail them today might be more helpful ways around. But yeah, I mean, I don't, that is a great question and I definitely do not have the answers for how to fix um, some of that, that kind of stuff. But I think, yeah, I think for me, it really just comes down to like, how are we thinking about power and treating Native folks' authority to make their own informed decisions about proper policy for their nations. But if anyone else on here has other, other thoughts on that, I'd actually also love to, to hear it, as I am very much not based in a First Nations community, so. Thanks, Liz. Maybe I can follow up. Um, I have a I have a sort of uh, a related question, and I'm I'm just kind of I'm curious um, how you see I guess the current you know the current moment you know when when these struggles are so visible the struggles of um, you know for migrant justice migrant rights and indigenous rights which have really kind of crested into view I think in a very different way in the last you know two years maybe in particular. Um, you know, in part because of the, the the things that have you know been revealed uh, around residential schools here and and um, Standing Rock and um, the wet sweat in territory and Micmac, the issues in with the Micmac lobster fisheries in Canada and all these different cases. Um, and I'm wondering if you see this kind of if you think this the current moment that we're in, you know, the kind of work that you are doing, the kind of work that also. Uh, Laura um, Matakoro is doing, um, you know, for kind of, I don't know, thinking about these new possibilities for, you know, what you talk, what you call an um, kind of intersectional movement um, that brings these uh, struggles together. If you see, I mean, if you see a kind of, if you see an opening, uh, an opening here for a kind of serious engagement with these, with these questions. I know that you were, um, you know, you were saying at the end of your at the end of your talk that you're, you know, that that um, you know this idea of naturalizing, you know, migrants is not really a viable one, and that it's more a kind of, um, you know, as you put it in your argument, a kind of invitation to kind of reposition and reframe and, and ask these questions and kind of think critically about the automaticity of the nation state and the way in which we've just kind of taken that on. Um, but I'm, I, I'd be curious to hear a little bit, I guess, about about the, you know, about how you see this particular moment and these convergence of, um, you know, things that have that, that we're thinking about and that kind of dominate, um, you know, our conscious consciousness, I guess, um, and then also um, the possibilities for for a kind of serious movement emerging, um, you know, kind of political movement emerging. Um, I know you, you also you were talking in your article about the work of activists like Nick Estes and um, Melanie Yazzie and um, but I'm just kind of curious uh, you know whether this is something that's much more widespread or whether these are just sort of isolated um, you know instances of just to give us a more of a sense of the landscape I guess yeah for sure so I want to be clear that like I don't mean to foreclose the potential of indigenous nations to make decisions about, you know, yes, we are going to try and naturalize people. I think it would be dangerous. And I think that um, meaning like just for the, the nations pursuing this, not in any kind of um, critical, I don't mean to critique them for that. I mean, in terms of like the way that both the Canadian and the US government, when Native nations have tried to expand their sovereignty and their jurisdiction, there's very frequently a serious backlash. So I think it would have serious political ramifications, but I, I wouldn't say that it's not possible for all Native nations. I think in particular, Native peoples who have large land bases, um, who exist in conditions of indigenous abundance, right? People who control their own territory, who have healthy waters, right? Who have access to territory, that might be a good case are a good place to try it. I think I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm from a very small nation. Um, there's fewer than 4,000 citizens in uh, my community and we lost almost all of our land through allotment and then through a policy of US termination. So in terms of like resources and availability, I just didn't wanna suggest that, you know, I had either the political capital or the ability to tomorrow and turn around and say like, Peoria is y'all need to start taking folks 
immediately, but, but I don't think that it's necessarily an impossibility. It would just have to be done very strategically with an eye to the possible backlash from settler governments. I think one of the potentials in thinking about like what's the landscape and where it could be going forward is that I think a lot of the, um, what I perceive to be tension between these conversations around rights of immigrants and rights of indigenous people have to do with a framework that suggests that there's an inherent dispossession in a way that more immigration, you know, disempowers native nations. And I think back to what I was saying about relationality and access to territory coming through relationships of obligation. I don't know that fix is the right word, but I think one of the ways to address this is by these kinds of conversations about accountability. Usually we talk about um, people who are settlers or people who are supporting settler state as accountable to the settler state and the political apparatus. Whereas relatives and relations are people who show up and say, I am accountable to the people whose land I live on. I am accountable to the people who are already here, right? And this may provide us a framework for thinking about alternatives that don't just set up, this is a zero sum game over territorial control, but say like, what if indigenous migrants can support native nations by becoming invested in understanding their histories and understanding their political goals and forging real kinds of solidarity. And I know that organizers like Harsha Walia, like other folks are already having these kinds of conversations and doing a lot of the educational work around, okay, if you've immigrated to New York or Ontario or wherever you're going, you know, can you think about like the community that you're entering into, not just as the Canadian state, but also as the First Nations who are on that land. And I think that may provide some space um, to think about relationships uh, between migrant and indigenous communities in ways that are mutually reinforcing instead of always framed through the settler state. I think in terms of like, is this fringe? Is this mainstream? What's happening with this? I see us as living through a period of tremendous indigenous activism resurgence in the post I don't know more post Standing Rock era. I think those two things in tandem really revitalized a kind of activist um, and I guess strident political sensibility that was largely invisible in, and y'all will have to jump in and tell me if this is you know how you're viewing it from the other side of the border as well, but. I think that there's a lot more coverage of indigenous issues and presence and stuff. And sure, some of that is truth and reconciliation, but I think that a lot of that is native people's really savvy uses of social media and the huge amount of um, political organizing that's gone into mobilizing indigenous communities. Not, I mean, we're even really beyond just the US and Canada, right? I'm thinking of like Erta Caceres and Lenca activism. I'm thinking of all of the ways of Manukea of indigenous peoples who have seized this moment and seized both settler colonialism as a framework, but also these kinds of transnational conversations as a way to push forward. So do I think that in most indigenous communities, immigration is a central topic of conversation at this moment? Probably not, because I think so many of us operate from crisis to crisis, where it's like, you know, are you dealing with COVID deaths right now? Are you dealing with water restrictions? Are you dealing with all of these other things that make it really, really hard to think about investing tribal government resources? But I think Native youth in particular, um, and of course, generations of people who've been doing this for, you know, long before uh, social media showed up on the scene. Like, I do think that we're in a moment where there's more visibility more intentional international organizing and where the conversation is really shifting um, in the folks that certainly in the generation but right behind me um, about how they're envisioning indigenous struggles and what that would mean for the contemporary era. I don't know that that's a really satisfying answer, but I guess I don't, if you had asked me 10 years ago, I probably would have said that like the Nick Estes and Melanie Yazzie approach is super fringe. And it's not my sense that that is the case um, necessarily anymore at this moment. Thank you so much. Um, Kazue, you have your hand up. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for a very insightful lecture uh, uh, talk today. Sorry, I, I missed the half part because I had a class and so I rushed to your talk. I'm really excited to, to hear your, your talk today. And I actually have a question about your uh, idea of native you know, sovereignty and you cite uh, Audra Simpson's uh, book and particular idea of uh, politics of refusal. I, I really like her, her book. And, uh, um, but 
but I, I, what I see, you know, in Canada, for example, you know, Canada try to implement UNDRIP, you know, we talk about a lot of uh, indigenous sovereignty, but I feel like if you visit Kanawage, fundamental kind of, I don't know, disconnection between this idea of sovereignty and how, you know, uh, uh, Mohawk using a uh, Haudenosaunee passport going to Geneva, you know, indigenous leaders are really active, but at the same time that uh, I kind of agree with this older Simpson's idea of politics of refusal, kind of refusing, right, everything. And uh, I, I feel like, for example, that the people using Haudenosaunee passport, but I still see it as a sort of illicit you know, because against, right, the, the conventional view of sovereignty. So I, I, like, I kind of frustrated that the, there's no kind of agreement and the fundamental we are kind of, kind of misunderstanding or there's no conversation, we talk a lot, but so what's your view about this native sovereignty? Do we really know <laughs> this idea of sovereignty? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think one of the, I think you're exactly right to point to invisibility as a real challenge for exercising native sovereignty in the current moment, right? Is that you have to first um, see and recognize indigenous people, you know, whether we're just in jeans and flowers, uh, shower slides or in regalia as real and, and as deserving therefore of the political um, accountability and political status of having separate nations. And once you've hit that hurdle, I mean, I think I think that there's for a long time been um, as part of this colonial project, right, this fiction that the US and Canada control all of the land within their borders. And that, you know, this period of the contest between indigenous nations and settler states is over, it's finished. And it is an impossibility that in the future, indigenous authority and autonomy and land bases will be expanded. And I think that ideology is really powerful and really pervasive and is part of what makes it really difficult for Mohawk nationals to travel to play lacrosse on Iroquois passports. And so I think, you know, as an academic, a lot of the work here is first an intellectual struggle over trying to get people to think seriously about Native nations as normal, contemporary, modern nations who have autonomy to make informed decisions about what their policies and their people and folks should be doing. And what I think is really powerful about Audra's work is that she's saying that just by refusing not only you know, the borders, but also the terms of the debate, right? About what it is to be Mohawk, what it is to be a citizen um, is a way of unstabilizing these sort of colonial assertions to power. So yes, indigenous sovereignty is deeply contested. It's very frustrating because you know, for so much of what in the United States we want to do, we have to run through the federal government, right? We hit all of these walls and barriers. There are real economic challenges that prevent Native nations from exercising the kind of power that they might like to. Um, but at the same time, I see the fundamental survival and endurance and insistence of Indigenous people in the present that they have the rights of these things and the rejection of these colonial orators as making real the fact that native people continue to exercise authority, to have community and to exist in ways that you know, challenge uh, the orders of these settler states. So again, there's a huge power imbalance, but I do think that this, this continued fight is really central to native people's ability to exercise sovereignty, including the, the intellectual work beyond, beyond the on the ground, you know, crossing through borders and chaining yourself to um, bulldozers and all of that sort of end of things. Yeah, thanks. I realized on Zoom that like this hand wavy thing I do in real life seems even more terrifying. And now I'm, I'm realizing I probably should have sat on my hands for this talk, but yeah. Gabriella. Hi, thank you so much for your lecture. It was really informative, especially as like a non-Indigenous person. So um, since I've like come to Canada, I've noticed like land acknowledgements have often been like a gateway for further learning about like um, colonial histories of like Canada and also the, of the United States and um, to like acknowledge Indigenous communities and um, like just 
um, just acknowledging the colonial histories that they've had to endure and continue to endure in like different ways today. Um, so my question is, to what extent do you think it's possible for land acknowledgements to like integrate like the multinational migration between communities that you were talking about, while also respecting like the traditional nations that have occupied the lands that we currently know as like Canada and it's like constituent provinces? Yeah, um, that's a really good question, especially because there's so much, uh, I think, debate and like conversation over the utility of land acknowledgements right now. So I see I see land acknowledgements as doing a couple of different things. Um, one option here is to say that as to um, this, this question that we we're talking about, about invisibility, right, in the erasure of indigenous histories, I see them as serving in many ways as mini histories, as an opportunity to acknowledge this past and in many if they're done well right to insist on a present as well that makes people stop and think for just a second about the land that they're on and gives you this opportunity to say something about um indigenous folks in this space i think a stronger perhaps land acknowledgement also comes with some kind of commitment right which is like why is it that you're bothering to acknowledge this past is your university is your institution is whatever it is that you are um, doing this acknowledgement at, is there a promise there to do something to rectify the violence, to rectify this past, to rectify the colonial order, or thought about differently to be accountable to the people that you are acknowledging? Because there's really nothing worse than one of those like vapid, you know, this used to be the homeland of so-and-so, and now we'll, we'll talk about biomechanics. And you're just kind of left going like, what was the, that feels so performative, what was the point of that kind of thing? So I think to your question about you know relations and sovereignty and stuff if you think about these as little opportunities to tell stories right to do kind of a, a statement about something that's politically important i um i very rarely like write out land acknowledgements before i do them because i feel like that some of what makes them unpowerful is the roteness of them sometimes whereas something like if you wanted to say you know this is uh, for New York City, where I currently am. I said it's one of the largest uh, urban indigenous populations in the United States. And this is true not only for what in the US we call American Indian populations, but also for indigenous populations from Mexico, from Guatemala, uh, from El Salvador, who have come and made their homes here, as well as Mun people, right? As well as like indigenous Hawaiian, Maori folks. And so this becomes, in some ways, an indigenous mecca. So that would be a way to think about integrating a migrant history um, or immigration stories into a land acknowledgement. I, basically, I think you absolutely could do that. And I think that land acknowledgements are most useful when they speak directly to the topic of whatever it is that you're gathering here to meet. And they're attentive to the current political moment and crisis. So if there's Native nations doing work with migrant communities and not something you want to integrate. Like I, I just think that they're like exactly what you're saying. They're opportunities, openings for conversations, um, as opposed to being sort of a thing that in and of itself finishes, closes, or finalizes. The one thing I will say is that I don't find it especially useful when people do land acknowledgments that try and just hit everything and feels more like a performative mishmash of and there's a history of slavery and there's a history of migration. And it's like build that into the talk as opposed to clearing it up front as something that, um, anyway, yeah, I, I get asked about land acknowledgements very, very frequently. And I think one of the first questions I usually ask is like, why, what's the purpose and what you're trying to get out of that? And I think maybe that's a way to enter into, um, you know, how to bring these conversations together. I, again, I'd be happy to hear from someone else on this, this topic. I don't want to be the, final word on. Uh, and Thank then, you. Yeah, yeah. So we have a, um, a question in the chat um, from Sena Lee. Uh, I've been doing research on indigenous inclusion in French, but I've realized there is a lack of resources in French. In, in French in Canada as a person who is not indigenous I was wondering if you noticed a divide between francophones and anglophones in indigenous conversations yeah that's a really good question um I think because I'm a uh, an early American historian I'm, I actually don't know a more contemporary source base in Canada as well I think in terms of French language and English language um 
conversations, I'm actually much more familiar um, both with Louisiana, which is where I work, and then with France than I am with the Francophone conversations in Canada. And it does seem to me that sort of uh, France-based conversations around Indigenous people are still very steeped in older anthropological tropes about Native people in ways that um, are sometimes kind of difficult to work with in terms of framing. Whereas in uh, Louisiana, I think there's more interesting work um, on shared indigenous and Cajun experiences. But unfortunately, I really don't know uh, Francophone conversations so much in Canada about like, you know, how native people are portrayed. I will say that in same in my period, so the 17th and 18th century, there's tremendous um, uh, French record keeping from New France on indigenous activities in Canada. So that probably doesn't help you with more contemporary stuff, but um, French uh, imperial officials, you know, all through the St. Lawrence River Valley, all through the Great Lakes region, they write and they write and they write about native people. So there's a tremendous body of work that's in French language, which I think also for um, those of us who primarily speak English uh, has been a barrier to a lot of people writing about and investigating these histories um, because some of these languages are not in, in I'm sorry, some of these sources are not in English, but um, I think there's, if there are grad students who are interested in this, I think there's huge potential in the French colonial sources to do really interesting things with gender and society um, and kind of political action, but yeah, sorry, I don't have a better answer for the contemporary conversations. Other questions or comments? Uh, there is another one in the chat. Um, oh gosh, yeah. Um, okay, so the, the question that I see is, do you have insights about UNDRIP's uh, implementation in the US and current challenges on indigenous self-governance? I think this is a really good question and um, something that's just really, I mean, as you know, it was a huge fight to get the United States to sign UNDRIP, right? Like. This has been a, an ongoing battle over acknowledging the rights of indigenous people. And I think one of the productive things about UNDRIP is I think if I think about like Standing Rock, for example, right? UN observers found that state and federal um, military forces and police were violating the rights of Lakota people um, at Standing Rock. But what did that do in terms of practice? I think this is always the challenge for UNDRIP formulations is it's, I live in New York City, so it's one of the, um, places where the UN uh, Permanent Forum on Indigenous People folks gather annually, which means that we have a chance to hear from many different nations. And where I feel like UNDRIP is really productive is in helping people articulate on a global scale what individual governments are doing to oppress Indigenous populations, in particular for things like water and land rights. But it's really, really hard because there's not kind of a, there's not teeth, right? There's not a like, force that's going to press the federal government into complying with the provisions in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So I think it's another one of those things that politically and intellectually is really important and a really key tool. But in terms of its practicability, I think you're exactly right to say like there's there's challenges with the implementation because the policies look good, but that doesn't necessarily materialize um, in the, the US federal government following right the rights of um, provided for Native peoples within the uh, UN Accords. I think one of the, just going off of that, one of those things that's super different, and I'm sure most of you already know this, is that, that we have tribal court systems in the United States. So there are spaces where you can go before native courts um, and native sort of legal structures. And there's been really recent challenges um, through the Supreme Court uh, to basically expand the territorial jurisdiction of 
Creeks, Chickasaws, Choctaws, a bunch of um, native communities in Oklahoma. And I think that that in turn has raised some really interesting questions about implementation, um, policing and regulation of territory for non-native people. And I think that that might be a space for thinking about like how do you, if, if the UNDRIP question is on some degree, like how do we defend the rights of native people? Um, thinking seriously again about the expansion of native political structures, of native courts, um, of native judicial processes, this might be one way to come at trying to protect um, indigenous territories. Again, I think a lot of the, what I feel like I keep emphasizing um, in the talk today is just this kind of, can we imagine indigenous nations as growing and expanding rather than caught in this, we only get to defend things that we're losing um, over a longer period of time. Kai. Hi, thanks so much for the talk. Um, it's been really lovely to hear you speak on this. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, sort of the transnationalization of indigenous struggles uh, and perhaps um, in more concrete terms, how, how we can think about um, indigenous struggles in Canada um, being connected to indigenous struggles across the world. Um, you know, where are those connections being made um, and maintained? Um, just to kind of take this into another context. Yeah, that's a great question. Again, I really think that the, the double punch of Idle No More and then the Dakota Access Pipeline and the social media explosion that uh, sort of linked both of those and mobilized both of those movements has been really important for exporting and revitalizing transnational indigenous ideals. I think about things like, you know, in Australia, indigenous Australians um, litigating for the rights of rivers, right, in conversation. I think about peoples in Hawaii who are pushing for acknowledgement of the sacredness of Mauna Kea, drawing off of Standing Rocks, very successful, you know, like water is sacred, water is life. Um, I think about all of these these conversations, um, again, to go back to what so it in, uh, I think that that's like a perfect corollary to the Dakota Access Pipeline in terms of thinking about unceded territory and rights of native people um, and the connection between missing and murdered indigenous women, girls and two-spirit folks and infrastructure development. So I definitely see that there is a growth in these transnational politics. I think that there was kind of a moment of explosion in the Cold War era uh, leading up to and around what for in the United States we found as the American Indian Movement era of the 1970s, where people were really writing and thinking and talking about fourth world politics. So indigenous communities grappling with their experiences, not just in the context of national politics, which is some of what gives rise to the American Indian Movement, but saying, you know, what do we have in common with people in Guam? What do we have in common with folks in El Salvador? How can we think comprehensively about the way that our communities are enduring violent extraction, lack of control over educational systems, all of these kinds of things. And I think we lost sight in the larger kind of conversation of a lot of that in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. And then I think, again, I don't know more, which I, for Standing Rock, I think that really built off of I Don't Know More and then the Black Lives Matter movement has kind of pushed again this international politics moment. And to the previous question, I think the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People again helped provide a global framework. And so I, I definitely see that filtering back and forth. In many ways, I actually feel like First Nations communities are doing um, some of the more interesting intellectual work in terms of thinking through um, articulations of land rights and relationality and sort of queer indigenous studies in the moment. And so a lot of what we're, we have in the United States is influenced by um, these conversations among indigenous communities here. And I think same thing with the, uh, so in New York City, I think one of the really interesting things that's happening is like indigenous migrants in the city rebuilding, right? Like Mishtek communities here to think about you know, how to exercise indigenous rights, even if you're not on your indigenous homelands and build some sustained community as part of that framework. So it's a very, uh, I guess, nebulous answer. But yeah, I think, I mean, I, I do think we're in this moment of kind of exploding international politics in a way that's, that's very 
um, promising. I see a question in the chat, I think. Um, state from Blair Rourke, state versus federal policies in the US, the provincial versus federal. Is there importance of state and provincial policies underestimated? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I will admit I'm not like <laughs> super versed on the provincial kind of power in Canada in terms of the indigenous, um, like power over indigenous people's lives. I think in the United States, states should not have power over indigenous nations. Only the federal government has power, which means that any court case, any kind of litigation will go before federal judiciary boards instead of through state policies where states do have power is over things like states need to create compacts with tribes for gaming, meaning that they need to come to agreements about how they're going to police the land around reservations, how um, they're going to enforce control over non-native people on indigenous spaces. And so it's not like states actually have no power, but theoretically they're not supposed to have power. I think in terms of provincial stuff in Canada, I think one of the kind of real sites of contest I, it, just in the moment we're in, right, is equal access to healthcare. And for rural um, indigenous communities, like do provinces need to put more funds and more support for making sure people can get to a hospital, that they have water, that they have access to things that will help keep communities healthy. And that to me seems like something that has to be, or that, you know, historically has been very much vary province to province depending on the resources and the investment um, in those indigenous communities. And so I think making sure um, that native people have, yeah, basically access to things that let communities be healthy um, and let people have access to equal kind of education systems is really, I, I think one of the things that would for me seem most urgent in terms of provincial politics and relationships. Thank you so much. I think probably um, we're coming close to the end of our of our time with you. It's been really um, it's been really inspiring. And um, as someone who also works on related issues, I work with Palestinian refugees um, and think about these questions in that context. Um, I really it's very inspiring to kind of think about the possibility of these pre statist imaginaries and different ways of thinking about um, belonging to place. Um, you know, I think of the language of ahal al and these, you know, the, the terms that are that are kind of being forged through this kind of thinking about um, how people thinking about relationality and, and ties to place um, that kind of obviate citizenship or, you know, kind of invite us to, to really um, think about the usefulness of states um, or how to get rid of them. Um, so it's it's been really inspiring to listening to you and and um, reading your work and thinking about these um, really productive alignments of you know thinking about these different kinds of experiences of displacement um, indigenous peoples and refugees and um, uh, the kind of subordinate relationship to the nation state form and how we can kind of think uh, critically uh, with that. So um, thank you so much for your time. And um, as I said at the beginning, I really hope we can bring you here in person, um, maybe with Laura too, uh, which would be really great. Yeah. Um, and uh, I wanted just to quickly say at the end too that um, the next talk, the next ISID talk will be on October 7th, which is going to be a panel discussion on human rights and democracy in South Asia. So please um, come to that and uh, you know the information and link I guess is available on the ISID um, website so I hope many of you will be able to join us and thank you so much for the questions and um, for joining us today so with that I will say goodbye to you all. Yeah, thank you so much this was a pleasure.